It is indeed a beautiful Thursday morning, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Newspaper Review on High Impact Television. I am Sarah Oswansa. Right now, we have our guest, a political um, analyst as well as businessman in person of Dakpo Adara Mewa, joining us live in the studio to have conversations this morning. Good morning, Mr. Dakpo. Thank Good you for morning. joining us Thank on the you review. Very much. All right, very quickly, I'll move on to what we have making headlines this morning, talking about Anambra killings, you know, insecurity in Anambra State, where the Anthony General of the Federation and Minister of Justice in person of Abuba Kamalami yesterday after the FEC meeting stated that the federal government might impose a state of emergency in the state with the insecurity situation in the country. When you got that report, how did you react to it? Uh, I, I think my first thoughts were... Um there seems to be a general kind of insecurity in Nigeria as a whole. And I would wonder why uh, it is Anambra in specific that we want to declare a state of emergency. Um, that's not to say the insecurity there is not terrible. Mm -hmm. Even one life being lost to insecurity in Nigeria is, is, is enough. But I will question the, the rationale behind declaring a state of emergency, considering that um, the state is not, shall we say, as ravaged as some other parts of this country. So. I wouldn't, I wouldn't understand why, why he feels that that's necessary. Some people have linked it to the upcoming elections, and I wouldn't say that's that's too far fetched. Um, I think there is probably some some under, un, underlying reasons other than the insecurity for them to want to declare a state of emergency there. So there are speculations that this um, announcement is politically motivated, as a, in a bid to rig the forthcoming elections. Do you think that actually? Um, holds water? Um, well, we, we wouldn't be able to ascertain for sure, but I think uh, if you were drawing on to the, the textbook of, uh, shall we say, uh, how to rig an election, if there was ever a book written about that, one of, one of the cardinal ways of rigging an election would be to declare a state of emergency to prevent the people from going to the boat to the polls and making them feel unsafe in order to reduce the amount of people so that way you can come up with whatever results that you want. So yes. Okay, so just for clarity, yeah, you know, we've had states, a couple of states in Nigeria um, face high insecurity challenges. It's safe to say that Anambra State is one of the peaceful states in the country, and these other states have had to prepare for gubernatorial elections, and there was no form of um, conversation on a state of emergency. In your perspective, what exactly do you think um, is the problem is it because would we say it's because it is in the south you know earlier on you talked about it being linked to ipop speculations about it being linked to ipop what exactly would you say is the reason for this particular move uh, I, I believe it, it has nefarious purposes in terms of why they would want to declare a state of emergency now if somebody was to declare a state of emergency i would advise that the government should declare a state of emergency in nigeria as a whole um, we know Lagos is insecure, we know many parts of the North are insecure, people are being kidnapped and killed on a regular basis. So if the government wants to be fair and declare a state of emergency, then why not declare a state of emergency all over Nigeria? And thinking about it, this government has over six years to fix the insecurity in the nation. I don't think uh, declaring a state of an emergency one year before the end of your term is really going to make any difference. Okay, so. Um Let's now move to the Constitution, yeah? A lot of people have quoted um, the 1999 Constitution, Section 35, uh, rather Section 305, Subsection 3, where I'll just, you know, break it down a little, where it says the President shall have the power to issue a proclamation of state of emergency only when the Federation is at war, the Federation is in imminent danger of invasion or involvement of a state of war, and it goes on like that. Now, does the federal government of Nigeria actually have the powers to declare a state of emergency in Anambra state or in any state at all in the country? Um, well, I'm not a constitutional expert, but my understanding is that in terms of constitutional powers, they do have that power um, to declare a state of emergency. And I think um, under the Obasanjo regime, we had cases like that. Um, uh, so it's not, it's not a question of if they have the power, it's a question of why would they exercise that power. It's a question of is it right, is it, is, it, is it proper, considering all that's happening around the country, and why haven't we seen more states of emergency declared, and why is this state of emergency coming just on, on, on the cusp of an election? So those are the questions I, I think we should be asking. Okay. Um, 
Now, if we know that if a state of emergency is declared in Anambra state, you know, that, uh, what exactly would happen to the government of that state if this is actually um, put into effect? I think it just allows the, the president to pretty much rule by decree and, um, you know, it's almost like a state yeah, of martial law. Uh, well, it, 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 the state of emergency in, in part suspends the whole notion of democracy, so it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very strong thing for the federal government to want to deploy and there is a lot to question as to why they are doing that in of all the states in the federation and Abra state. Okay, um, before we move on from this particular conversation, now what do you think, this information has come out here, yeah? this uh, government, the governor, leaders, in Anambra State have reacted to this saying that Anambra State at this point does not, a state of emergency doesn't need to be declared, that things are still under control even though we see how killings and everything take place every day, that schools are still in operation. Now at this point what do you think or what would you advise the federal government, the government rather of Anambra State to do differently to avert a breakdown of law and order in preparation for the November 6th elections? I, I think the, the, the big question is what can they do differently? The, the governor and the governors around the country ha, are not in charge of their own security. At most, they can arm a few people with Dane guns that are used for hunting. And that is all they have the constitutional power to, to do. They are not in charge of their own security, unfortunately, under the 1990 constitution. And so there's not really much they can do to, to, to really stop the, this tide. And that is why we need to look at things like state policing that would allow the governors to have some control of what goes on within its borders. They cannot determine where the army is being deployed. They can't even, the governor can't even determine where the police will be deployed. And so a lot of these things rest on the federal government. And it's the same federal government with all the tools that it has that it seems unable to be able to rein in all the insecurity, particularly in our number of states about state policing i know that the southern governors you know in the conversation on this restructuring and to open grazing law and everything have talked about creating uh, security outfits in each region some are already in um mm -hmm. some are already functioning to govern their own state now do we see a possibility of a shift or moving or postponing the anambra gubernatorial elections because of this insecurity. Do you think there's a possibility that that would happen? I think there are some elements in the government that would like to see that. Um, I think it's a very old political tactic for people to postpone elections in the hopes that, um, you know, till a more favorable time. It's, it's not new. Uh, I do hope it does not get to that. Um, but again, under the Constitution, uh, they do have that power. Uh, but it, I, I always find it really strange when we talk about the Constitution because if we look at the, the antecedents of this, this particular government, we will realize that it doesn't particularly care for constitutions mm -hmm. or does, has no respect for the Constitution, has severally violated the Constitution. And then in some particular incidences, when it's convenient, um, you know, it, it will respect the Constitution. I, I describe this government as purely uh, a government of vibes. Whatever they feel like is right is what they do. Okay, because you talked about constitution here, yeah, we know some months back the conversation, and it's still ongoing, the, the conversation about reviewing, amending the 1999 constitution was on. Now, with all you've talked about in regards to the Constitution, do you think that 1999 Constitution is not appropriate for us as a country? Do you think it should be reviewed? Do you think it should be amended? Do you think it should be absolutely eradicated? I think it should be amended. And in fact, I did, um, I did attend one of the town hall meetings. I made some proposals in regards to amending the Constitution. And I finished that, my statement, um, with, with the notion that this is not the first time we've done a constitutional, uh, shall we, a party in and around, okay, let's look at what we really do want to review. And consistently, this happened at least four times uh, in, in previous times, and nothing has ever happened. It seems like once the populace gets to the point where they complain and complain, they almost feed us this idea that we have some power. They gather us around, put us in a nice place, let us vent our anger, and then go back to business as usual. So it's, it's very unfortunate that we've seen no actual significant steps to amend the constitution that has been nothing but detrimental to the Nigerian people. 
the, the talks have been that, uh, you know, they are moving the motion, they are having meetings, but, you know, we'll get to see how that eventually unfolds. In, uh, Let's hope the this time is different from all the other times. I did. We've taken a look at the Anambra killings and, you know, the statement talking about imposing a state of emergency in the state. But right now, we'll move very quickly to another conversation that is making rounds, talking about the value-added tax saga, where the federal government also, after the federal executive meeting, which was held in Abuja on Wednesday, the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, hinted that the federal government is considering taking states that are, you know, backing this VAT law to the Supreme Court. How do you react to this? I, I think it's, um, it's a good development in the sense that it helps us truly understand um, what the limits of the federal government and the states are and helps us define their roles a bit more clearly. Now, on the issue of VAT, it's not mentioned in the Constitution, and so there's a lot of debate in and around that. So it's, it's only fair for, for, for them to take it all the way to the top. Uh, it ties in a bit with this whole idea of restructuring and understanding what our roles and what powers belong to the states. So um, are you, or do you believe, or you, do you go with the school of thought that, is, that agrees with state government collecting the VAT to their states? I, I believe to an extent state governments should um, take a, a large share of the VAT, but then we still have to discuss the issue of interstate trade and who would collect uh, the VAT on that, which I believe should be the federal government, as well as uh, VAT on importation and, and exportation of goods or exported goods. I believe that should still stay with the federal. Um, so, so I believe th to an extent they're both right, but I, I really want to see the end of it. I want to see how far we push this and it will serve as a precedent for other issues that we need to discuss in terms of state and federal power. Okay, we get to see how this eventually plays out. Well, but still, see. on the same issue, but talking about the anti-open grazing law, I'm sure you're familiar with that conversation as well. And Abu Bakr Malami, again, we've had to talk about him several times in this conversation, yes. has said that that law that is being signed by southern governors is infringing on movement of um, persons, and that's also infringing on their fundamental human right. I think that's ridiculous. Okay, what? Uh, do forgive me uh, for being so frank, but, um, you know, the, 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 the land in states belongs to the governor of the state. That is mm -hmm. very clear and we can determine. Nobody is saying you cannot con conduct your business. If mm -hmm. I wanted to start selling, uh, shall we say, roasted corn, for example, I couldn't very well come into the studio and set up a corn stall uh, in the name of my freedom of movement, you know. So uh, I believe it's a non-starter. I believe the, the South uh, retains the right to determine what goes on in its, in its, within its borders. And I, I welcome his challenge. Uh, and uh, I'm very sure the South will prevail. Do you, um, do you see a sort of resolution coming up in regards to this anytime soon? Because this conversation has been on for months now. And there's been a lot of back and forth, no headway. Do you see um, this Southern governors as well as the northern part and the open grazing law, farmers, headers and everything. Do you see us reaching an equilibrium anytime soon on this issue? Uh, I think if, if, uh, if logic is to prevail and if, um, if, you know, shall we say progress is to prevail, then yes, we should find, uh, I mean, we're not talking about everybody in the south eats meat, you know. We enjoy the benefits of having you know, cows and stuff. So what we're saying is like every 21st century country, we shouldn't have uh, animals just roaming around people's farms and eating up their crops. It's not done, you know. Okay, so some persons are of the opinion that rather than outrightly banning grazing in the southern parts, a law should be implemented that these heathers should not be seen with ammunition guns and all of that, rather they should just move around with sticks, that that would be a better proposition. Do mm -hmm. you think that will suffice? Well, you know, a stick is still a weapon. Um, so, no, I, I don't think that would suffice. I think what we're talking about here is why can't we have the grazing being done on a controlled space. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot that can be said about maybe the governors, the southern governors also creating an avenue because I believe you always have to do a bit of balance. You mm -hmm. can't just ban something without creating a, an, alternative. A, an alternative. So well, on one hand, we do ban open grazing, but we have created some reserves. Mm -hmm. I think that's only fair so mm -hmm. that everybody benefits and everybody is fine. 
Um, but uh, I don't see why open grazing should be allowed in the 21st century. Quite a very strong point there. Ban open grazing creates reserves, so there's a balance and there's fairness. Mm. Okay, before we, I wrap it up with you on the review this morning, let's take a look at one more um, headline that you know made the rounds yesterday, where the NCC has disqualified Nigerians below 18 years from getting SIM cards. I, I can see how agitated you are over this uh, particular report. Mm. I, I, I find it absolutely hilarious. I, I, I said before, I, I, did, I, I would de describe this government as purely a government of vibes and inshallah, because it seems like um, they do what they feel like. It doesn't make any sense. Let's be realistic. This is 2021. Uh, under 18s are changing the world. Mm. They're creating technology that could change the world. And in my country, unfortunately, they can't own a SIM card. That's ridiculous. So there have been talks that this particular decision was taken because of insecurity issues, you know, to be able to manage the security, um, the security situation. Now, um, do you think this decision by the government was taken because of insecurity? Because there are talks that people that are younger are being, you know, lured into terrorism and other things through communication. Yes, uh, it, it, the idea is ridiculous that all of a sudden if we stop it under 18 from having SIM cards, uh, Boko Haram would disappear. Insecurity would disappear because yeah. we all know that the real reason why young people are going into this crime and going into all of these things is because they have a SIM card. That is ridiculous. Sometimes I feel like this government is just smokes and mirrors. It's we see a problem, we can't tackle the problem, and so we bring something and use it as a scapegoat. It's as about ridiculous as the the CBN governor saying that the reason why the naira is falling is nothing to do with the economic situation of the country, but to do with a blog. Mm. If I created another blog today, what? How, how powerful are blogs these days? So it, it's very ridiculous to say that those two things are about as connected as the moon uh, and cars. It really doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, well, I'm sure that there, there's going to be a follow-up because the issue is still being, you know, looked into. But this is where I'd like to draw the curtain with you on the review this morning. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your thoughts with us on News Thank you very much. That is where we wrap it up on the review this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Once again, thank you to our guest, Dakwa Adaramewa, for joining us on the review this morning. Remember that you can also join us again at 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. to get updates of these stories and more stories. It's time to hand over back and now to tea or coffee. Till I see you again, I am Sarah Osansa. Stay safe.